Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology, and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Ed Excel International GCSE Biology Paper 1B for January 2023. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1. The diagram shows a flower from an apple tree with some structures labeled. So this is the flower and we can see they've labeled various structures. So they say, this apple tree is able to self-pollinate which is the correct transfer of pollen during pollination. So it's going to transfer from this structure V to structure P, which is the stigma. And therefore, my answer is going to be C. In the next part, they say, which structure does the pollen tube grow down? It has to grow down the style. And therefore, this is part of the style. It should be structure Q. So A is going to be my answer. Moving on. Yeah, they say which structure develops into the seed. Let's go back here. This is going to be the structure that develops into the seed. So here we can see it's going to be C, which is my answer. In part B, the flower from an apple tree is insect pollinated. Give three differences between the structure of this apple flower and the structure of a wind pollinated flower, such as grass. The apple tree flowers have large and brightly colored petals, while the wind pollinated flowers do not. Also, the stigma of the apple tree flower is sticky, so that the pollen sticks onto it when the insects are moving by. Also, the pollen is large. This is talking about the pollen of the apple tree flowers. It is large and sticky, while wind pollinated flowers have light pollen, so that it can be carried away by the wind. Apple tree flowers contain nectary. This is to attract the insects, which act as pollinators. Moving on, here they say, the seeds of many plants are surrounded by sweet tasting fruit. Suggest how this enables the plants to spread their seeds. So these sweet tasting fruits are going to be eaten by animals. Then the seeds are going to be dispersed into new areas. Some eaten seeds can be ingested in new areas so that they grow in those areas where they've been dispersed. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, the diagram shows a transverse section through a human heart. So we can see this is the transverse section. They have leveled for us the right ventricle wall, the left ventricle wall. We see the coronary artery as well as the coronary vein. So the first question says, draw an X on the diagram to show the position of the septum. The septum is positioned between the two ventricles and therefore this is my X there. Down here they say, state two differences between the composition of the blood in the coronary artery and the composition of the blood in the coronary vein. Of course, arteries carry oxygenated blood, so we expect to have a higher concentration of oxygen and a lower concentration of carbon dioxide in the coronary artery. So here I say the coronary artery contains more oxygen than the coronary vein, and the coronary artery contains less carbon dioxide than the coronary vein. So here they say, Explain the differences between the left ventricle wall and the right ventricle wall. I want to first take you back to the structure. You can see the walls of the left ventricle are thicker, while those of the right ventricle are thinner. But this question is asking us to explain the differences. This means we have to state the differences and then give a reason as to why the differences are the way they are. So here I said, the left ventricle wall is thicker than the right ventricle wall. This is a fact observed from the structure given to us here. But why is it like that? This is because the left ventricle wall muscles contract more to generate high pressure to pump blood out of the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Moving on. In part B, the development of coronary heart disease is linked to a number of factors. Explain how these factors can increase the risk of developing coronary heart disease. The first is high blood pressure, which strains the coronary artery as well as the heart. Then there is smoking, which leads to high blood pressure. There is also lack of exercise that leads to more fat being stored in the body. Other factors are due to genetics. Some people are more likely to get coronary heart disease. Obesity and being overweight makes the heart work harder, so it becomes strained. Also, eating high fat diets increases blood cholesterol, which increases the chances of blocking the coronary artery. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. 
Question 3. The diagram shows the nutritional content of two non-dairy milk products, oat milk and almond milk. So we can see this is the oat milk and that is the almond milk. And we can see both of them are 2 to 5 grams. We have a higher amount of energy in here than in there. We have more fat, which is two times the fat contained in almond milk. We have 100 milligrams of sodium in 150 milligrams of sodium. So here there is more sodium content. The carbohydrate content in oat milk is twice that in almond. And then down here we see the fiber. There is more fiber as well as protein here. So fiber is beneficial for peristalsis, preventing constipation, while proteins are good for growth and repair. So here they say, a person is told by their doctor that they need to lose weight. Use the information from the milk content in your own knowledge to discuss which milk would be the most suitable for this person. Now remember, the aim is for losing weight. So you have to take the milk that has lower energy content, lower fat content, and lower carbohydrate content, which is going to be the almond milk. So here I said, oat milk provides more energy per 2 to 5 grams than almond milk, so there will be less weight loss. Oat milk provides more carbohydrate, which is twice, than almond milk, but they contain the same sugar content. Oat milk provides more fiber than almond milk, so this prevents constipation, meaning it helps with peristalsis. Oat milk provides more fat per 2 to 5 grams than almond milk, so more fat can lead to more weight gain. Oat milk provides twice the mass of protein, and we know proteins are required for growth and repair. So almond milk will be more suitable because it contains less fat, less energy, and less carbohydrate. However, weight loss can also depend on other factors like age, level of activity, as well as genetics. Moving on. Here they say, suggest why a person might drink a non-dairy milk, such as oat or almond milk, rather than cow's milk. This could be because they are lactose intolerant because we have lactose in cow milk and they could also be allergic to components found in cow milk. In part B, describe how a student could test a milk sample for glucose. To test for presence of glucose, you need to add Benedict's solution and then heat and then observe the color changes. If we see a red, orange, yellow or green color, then we know the food sample contains glucose. The red shows a higher concentration of reducing sugar, and the green shows a lower concentration of reducing sugars. In part C, human breast milk contains special proteins that give immunity to the baby. Explain how these proteins can help protect the baby from disease. Now, the special proteins are called antibodies, and these antibodies are specific to antigens for non-specific pathogens. So they cause the pathogens to stick together and then they also cause the destruction of the pathogens. The part where the pathogens stick together, it means phagocytosis is going to occur, destroying more pathogens within a shorter period of time. So this brings us to the end of question 3. Let's continue to question 4. Question 4. The papered moth is found in many countries. Two different forms of the papered moth are a light-colored moth and a dark-colored moth. The dark-colored moth was first observed in cities when pollution from burning coal stained tree trunks black. So here we see the light-colored moth and then the dark-colored moth. Then they say, scientists trapped moths in a city location from 1992 to 1998. The table shows the scientists' results. So here we have a table years from 1992 to 1998, and we can see the changes in numbers of the light-colored moths and the dark-colored moths. We can see these begin off lower, they increase, decrease, and then they begin to increase. And we see these, they are higher, they decrease, and then we have a higher at the end. But it's not as high as it was initially. So here they say, calculate the difference between the percentage of moths that are dark colored in 1992 and the percentage of moths that are dark colored in 1998. So the percentage of dark colored in 1992 was 27, Divide by the sum of the 2 times 100, as you can see here, and it was 75%. Then in 1998, the percentage was 9, divided by the sum of 9 plus 13, times 100, giving us 40.9, which I rounded off to 41%. Then in 
So the difference is going to be 75 minus 41 giving us 34. You could also have used 40.9. So we say 75 minus 40.9 and you would have got 34.1. So these two are acceptable. So my answer here is 34%. Moving on. In part B, plot a line graph to show the number of light colored moths and the number of dark colored moths from 1992 to 1998. So here we're using the results from the table and ensure that you use at least more than half of the provided grid. So on the vertical axis, I had the number of moths and on the horizontal axis, I had the time in years. So we can see from 1992 to 1998 and then I just plotted the results. The ones that are purple are the dark colored moths and then the one that is blue shows the light colored moths. So you have to choose a suitable scale you have to label the axis as well as put appropriate units. You have to position the points in the right place and then connect with a line because we need a line graph. Moving on. Here they say, in the 1990s, many cities introduced laws preventing the burning of coal. Comment on the changes in the number of light colored moths and the number of dark colored moths between 1992 and 1998. So we should know that the increase in the number of dark colored moths was due to pollution that painted or made the tree trunks to become black. So if they were blackened, it means it was a good camouflage. So the dark colored moths increased in number. However, if the burning of coal is decreased, then the pollution is going to decrease and the darkening of the tree trunks is also going to decrease, meaning now the dark colored moths can be seen better by the predators. That is why their numbers decreased. So here I said, initially, the number of light colored moths increased and then decreased from 1994 to 1996, then increasing again. Overall, the number of dark colored moths decreased and then increased. The decrease could be due to predation, disease or lack of food. Also, initially, the number of dark colored moths was higher than that of light colored moths. However, at the beginning of 1994, there were more light colored moths except in 1996. The darkened trees from burning coal provided camouflage for the dark colored moths, so their numbers were high. After reduction in the burning of coal, the trees were less dark, so the dark colored moths were easily seen by predators, meaning they were eaten and their numbers decreased. So those that survived had a selective advantage against the selection pressure, meaning they could disappear or fly away faster, so the predators couldn't eat them. So this brings us to the end of question four. Let's continue to question five. Question five. The chromosomes in a human cell can be photographed and then arranged in pairs to show the karyotype. White blood cells are often used to show the chromosomes in the karyotype. The chromosomes in white blood cells are larger and easier to see when the white blood cells divide. Diagram one shows the karyotype. We can see from chromosome one to chromosome 23 and we can see they're all present in pairs. We have 23 pairs, in total 46 chromosomes. So down here they say, explain why a red blood cell cannot be used to show a karyotype. Because a red blood cell has no nucleus, there are no chromosomes, so they cannot be used to show the karyotype. Then the next part says, state the type of cell division that occurs in white blood cells this is going to be mitotic cell division, or you could say mitosis. Here they say, the karyotype in diagram 1 is from a male. State how this can be deduced from the diagram. If I take you back here, we can see the sex chromosome has both the X and Y chromosome. This is the X chromosome, and that is the Y chromosome, which is shorter. So I say it has both the X and Y chromosome. Then here they say, Diagram 2 shows a karyotype from a white blood cell of another person. The karyotype is from a female, and the person has a condition called Turner syndrome. This condition affects the development of the ovaries, so they may not produce normal quantities of sex hormones. So with this karyotype, we only see one sex chromosome, meaning there is one X chromosome and no other X chromosome, yet yeah, this is a female. So continuing on, here they say, Comment on the differences between the karyotypes shown in diagram 1 and diagram 2 and the effects Turner syndrome will have on the person. 
use information from the question and your own knowledge in your answer. So I said, the first karyotype has 46 chromosomes, including two sex chromosomes. The second karyotype contains only 45 chromosomes. There is no Y chromosome in the female karyotype, so that is a difference. The female from the second karyotype does not produce normal quantities of hormones, so does not develop secondary sex characteristics normally. So the ovaries do not produce enough estrogen. The eggs are not produced normally, so she has a higher chance of infertility. And down here they say, suggest how the difference in the chromosomes of people with Turner syndrome may have been produced. If you remember, we saw that the person with Turner syndrome had only one sex chromosome, and in this case it was one X chromosome. It means the gamete that was fused with did not have an X chromosome or did not have a sex chromosome, so after fusion, there was no homologous pair in chromosome 23. So I said a mutation could have occurred, or failure of chromosomes to separate during gamete formation in meiosis. Question 6. A student uses this method to investigate osmosis in potato tissue. Cut three 5 cm long cylinders from a raw potato. Dry the cut surfaces using filter paper. Measure the mass of each cylinder using a balance. Place one cylinder in a test tube containing 10 cm cubed of concentrated sucrose solution. One cylinder in a test tube containing 10 cm cubed of distilled water and one cylinder in an empty test tube. Put a bang in each test tube and leave them for one hour. Remove the cylinders and dry them with filter paper. Measure the mass of each cylinder again and measure their lengths using a ruler. So this is concentrated sucrose solution. We can see there, there is distilled water. We see the potato cylinder as well as air. In here we have air, in here we have distilled water, in here we have the concentrated sucrose solution. We expect water to be lost from this potato cylinder, and therefore its mass should decrease. We expect this one to gain water by osmosis, so its mass should increase. And for this one, because it's in air, we expect no gain, but a very tiny decrease in mass due to evaporation. So here they say describe what's meant by the term osmosis. Osmosis is the net movement of water molecules, you could even say free water molecules, from a region of high water potential to a region of low water potential. Next they say, state the independent variable in the student's investigation. If you look here, we have a concentrated sucrose solution, distilled water, and then here without water. It means the concentration of the water or the solution is what we are varying. So here I say the concentration of the solution is the independent variable. The independent variable is something that is varied during an investigation. In part B, osmosis is affected by the surface area and volume of the cylinders, so the student keeps the original surface area and volume of each cylinder the same. Calculate the surface area of each cylinder using this formula. So this is the formula of surface area. So I just substituted 2 times 3.14 times 0 0.25 times 5 plus 2 times 3.14 times 0 0.25 squared. And using your calculator, I got that, which I rounded off to 8.2 to two decimal places. And that is my answer. Next, they say, explain how surface area would affect the rate of osmosis. If there is a larger surface area, there is more area in contact with a solution and therefore there will be more exchange or there will be more osmosis. So I said a large surface area increases the rate of osmosis because there is more potato area in contact with the water or with the solution. Next they say, state another variable that the student should control in the investigation. The student should control the temperature because the higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy, the more particles are going to move. That means the more the water molecules are going to move. Also, the type of potato should be the same. It would be better if all these cylinders were got from the same potato. That means the components within the potato tissues are going to be the same or they're going to be consistent. In part C, the table shows the students' results for the mass of the cylinders. So we see with a concentrated sucrose solution, the original is 2.1. And the final was 1.8, so there is a negative 
that occurred, meaning the mass decreased. This is because water was lost from the potato by osmosis to the higher concentrated solution. In distilled water from 2.1 to 2.3, there is an increase because water moved into the potato by osmosis. And in air, there was a tiny decrease from 2.2 to 2.1, and that could be due to evaporation in the air. Moving on. So here they say, explain the changes in the mass of the potato cylinder in each test tube. I have already explained about these changes in mass, so I'm just going to read here. The concentrated sucrose solution led to a decrease in the mass of the potato because water moved from the potato to the sucrose solution down a water potential gradient. And then distilled water led to an increase in the mass of the potato because water entered the potato by osmosis down a water potential gradient. Air had a slight decrease in the mass of the potato because some evaporation occurred. Down here they say, the student also measured the change in mass of each potato cylinder, assuming the length has the same percentage change as the mass. They wanted to calculate the final length of the cylinder in the concentrated sucrose solution. Now percentage change in the mass is going to be, you remember if I take you back here, we had the change to be like that. So that means the percentage change is going to be the negative 0 0.3, divide by the 2.1, which was the original times 100. Again, if I take you back, percentage change is usually change divided by original times 100. So if the length had the same, then we can use that in the concentrated sucrose solution. So negative 0 0.3 divided by 2.1 times 100 gives us that. Now we remember the original length was 5 centimeters. This was the original length of the potato cylinders. So the change is going to be that, which is negative 14.3, Divide by 100 times that, giving us that. So finally, we can see it's going to be 5 minus the change, giving us this. So the final is going to be 4.29. So this brings us to the end of question 6. Let's continue to question 7. Question 7. This food web is from an ecosystem in Africa. We can see these are all producers. These are primary consumers and we can see some that are secondary consumers. So here they say, which organism is a primary consumer? All these are primary consumers. So we have a termite, giraffe, gazelle, babon, zebra, and wildebeest. So among these is only the zebra. And then they ask, which of these has the least efficient energy transfer? If I look back here, it's gonna be star grass to baboon. So the next part says, which organisms will be less affected by a reduction in the population of star grass? If we see here star grass, uh, we can see a gazelle eats both star grass as well as acacia, so it's going to be less affected because it has another source of food. So my answer here is B. Moving on. In part B, explain why only a small proportion of energy contained within a trophic level is transferred to the next trophic level. This is because energy losses occur and some components are not consumed. So here I said, because some organisms are not consumed, so they just die and decompose. Also, some eaten parts are not digested, so they are ejected. So we can see this is through feces. Some parts of organisms are not eaten, like bones and teeth. There are also energy losses through respiration, and some energy is lost through excretion. This could be in urine as well as sweat. Moving on. Here they say, describe how scientists could compare the population size of star grass into areas of the ecosystem. This comparison could be carried out by counting the number of star grass. So you have to use a quadrat or you can say using quadrats. So a quadrat is used and it's going to be placed randomly in an area. Then the number of organisms per place quadrat are going to be counted. Then you repeat throws at various areas and then calculate the mean. Then you can scale up to calculate the total number of organisms in the whole area. This should be area. So moving on. Here they say, while dogs hunt a variety of prey species, they usually eat the weak and sick animals. Explain how this behavior may benefit the species the dogs hunt. 
Since they usually eat weak and sick animals, it means animals with weak allele or with weak immune systems are going to be taken away from the population, so making the population stronger and so they can mate with stronger organisms in order to have offsprings that have stronger alleles. So I said, the weak are killed, the stronger survive, the stronger mates can reproduce, and they pass on the alleles to their offsprings. You could also say, the weak animals do not reproduce, so the heart becomes faster because they will not be slowed down. So this brings us to the end of question 7. Let's continue to question 8. Question 8. Yeast can be used in food production. Which group of organisms does yeast belong to? Yeast belongs to fungi. The next part says, which substance is the cell wall of a yeast cell made of? It's made of chitin. Moving on. In part B, a teacher sets up an experiment to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of respiration in yeast. The diagram shows part of the apparatus the teacher uses. So we can see there is paraffin, and then there is yeast and glucose solution with diazine green. So this is the indicator. We know paraffin is there to prevent oxygen from entering. So here they say, explain the addition apparatus. The teacher will need to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of respiration in this experiment. So we need a water bath because temperature has to be controlled. Remember, we are investigating the effect of temperature. So once the temperature is set to less than 30 degrees, we do not want it to change. So we need to use a water bath to set the temperature. Also, since we are studying the rate, we need to have a stop clock or a timer in order to measure the time. Next, they say, state the purpose of the liquid paraffin on the surface of the glucose solution. Paraffin is there to prevent entry of oxygen. Down here, they say, give the name of a suitable chemical that would be used as an indicator X to show that the yeast is respiring. You can use lime water or you could use sodium hydrogen carbonate and then observe the color changes. Moving on. Here they say, diazine green changes color from blue to pink as oxygen levels in the yeast and glucose solution reduce. Explain how this color change gives information about the respiration in yeast. This is to help us to find out when oxygen is finished. So I said initially the color will be blue due to presence of oxygen. Remember they said it turns from blue to pink as the oxygen levels in the yeast and glucose solution reduce. So as the yeast respires, all oxygen will be used up. So the indicator will turn pink when oxygen is finished. In part C, explain why the rate of respiration in the yeast will change as the temperature is increased. We know respiration is enzyme controlled. So the change in temperature is going to affect the rate of enzyme activity. So I said as temperature increases, the enzyme and substrate will have more kinetic energy and frequent collisions will occur. So the rate of respiration will increase until the optimum temperature. After the optimum temperature, the enzyme's active sites will change shape. So the enzyme and substrate will no longer fit. This is the same as saying the enzyme is denatured. So the complex can no longer form and therefore the rate decreases. So this brings us to the end of question eight. Let's continue to question 9. Question 9. Plants need light for photosynthesis. Give the balanced chemical symbol equation for photosynthesis. It should be carbon dioxide, which is 6, plus water, which is 6, gives us glucose as well as oxygen. And here they say, in part B, the graph shows the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis in a water plant. So on the vertical axis, we have rate of photosynthesis in bubbles per minute. And on the horizontal axis, we have the light intensity in arbitrary units. Overall, we can see as light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases, and then it levels off after the maximum has been obtained. So we can safely say that from about this point here, no matter how much light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis does not increase because light intensity is no longer limiting the rate. It means maybe temperature or carbon dioxide concentration 
could be limiting the rate of photosynthesis. So here they say, the rate of photosynthesis is measured by counting the number of bubbles of gas released per minute. The light intensity is decreased by moving a lamp further away from the water plant. The light intensity is calculated as 1 divided by the distance in centimeters of the lamp from the plant, bracket you square that. So they say, using information from the graph, calculate the distance of the lamp from the plant when the rate of photosynthesis is 78 bubbles per minute. I came here and drew a line to the curve, and then from the curve to this horizontal place, and I got 0 0.16, so that is light intensity in arbitrary units. So this means 0 0.16, which is the light intensity, is equal to 1 divided by the distance squared. So distance squared is going to be 1 over 0 0.16, and therefore distance is going to be the square root of that, which gave me 2.5 centimeters. Moving on, here they say, describe the relationship between the number of bubbles per minute and light intensity. This is something we can see in the graph. The higher the light intensity, the higher the rate of photosynthesis, meaning the more the bubbles produce until light intensity is no longer limiting the rate of photosynthesis. So here I said, as the light intensity increases, the number of bubbles increases. The increase in the number of bubbles is initially steep, meaning at low light intensities. And then the number of bubbles level off at high light intensity. Explain the rate of photosynthesis between a light intensity of 0 0.4 arbitrary units and a light intensity of 0 0.8 arbitrary units. Here they've told us to explain the rate. So we have to tell the relationship and then give a reason as to why. So taking you back here, at 0 0.4, and at 0 0.8, we can see there is no difference. No matter how much the light intensity varies, we see there is no difference in the number of bubbles produced. So here I said, the rate of photosynthesis does not change because light intensity is not limiting the rate. So the reason is other factors like temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, may be limiting the rate of photosynthesis. So if you increase the CO2 concentration or use a higher temperature, maybe the rate will increase or more bubbles will be produced. So this brings us to the end of question 9. Let's continue to question 10. Question 10. The table gives some information about enzymes in the human digestive system. Complete the table by giving the missing information. So we have the substrate starch. It's worked on by the enzyme amylase and the product is going to be maltose. Then maltose is worked on by maltase to get glucose. And then protease enzymes work on proteins and the products are amino acids. Then lipids are worked on by lipase to produce fatty acids and glycerol. Moving on. In part B, some scientists have investigated the effect of vinegar, which is a weak acid on the digestion of starch. Design an investigation to discover the effect of vinegar on the digestion of starch. Include experimental details in your answer and write in full sentences. Now here we will use CORMS or what you see C, O, R, M1, M2, S1, and S2. So we know the C is for the conditions for the independent variable. This is for the organism. In this case, it's going to be the enzyme. So we have to make sure it's the same enzyme. And then R is for repeating the experiment. M1 is for measurement for the dependent variable within a specific period of time. And then the two standards that we have to keep constant. Here, the independent variable is vinegar. So to study its effects, we have to vary its concentration. So that's why I said, set up at least five different concentrations of vinegar. And because this is starch digestion, we need to have an enzyme and the starch has to be the same. The enzyme has to be the same. They have to be of the same concentration. So use starch of the same mass and from the same material, for example, it could be from potato or from corn. You could also use the same quantity of the enzyme. Then R is for repeating the experiment. This is to ensure that we get a mean. So here, repeat the experiment at each concentration of vinegar and calculate the mean. Then using iodine, test for how much starch is digested. This could be for measurement for the dependent variable. We are going to use iodine. If starch is still present, we're going to see a blue-black color. But once all the starch is gone, then the blue-black color is going to disappear. 
So this is what I wrote here. If starch is present, a blue black color is seen. Then the M2 is measurement for time. So meaning measure the time taken for all the starch to be digested, meaning until a negative iodine test is observed. Then S1 and S2 are for the things we have to keep constant. So control the temperature using a water bath. Again, remember here, temperature is not an independent variable. We are varying the concentration of vinegar. And since this is an enzyme controlled reaction, we have to ensure that temperature doesn't change for all experiments and use the same volume of amylase enzyme and the same volume of vinegar. So this brings us to the end of question 10, as well as to the end of this whole paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.